Aloha. Welcome. It's June 24th. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicello, your host. And this week, like last week and the week before that, we have so many things to discuss and so little time in which to discuss it. Um, I want to jump right in and talk about uh, the title of this show is Testing Needs to Slow Down. At the Trump rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we heard Donald Trump say the following. When you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. The next day, um, the media was all over that one saying, are you kidding? There's 120,000 American deaths. And it's through testing, do we try to eliminate or minimize COVID-19 uh, cases and deaths? And the White House, to their you know, to their challenge, had to come up with some answer. And that some answer was, well, come on, you guys. Donald Trump was kidding. Um, it was tongue in cheek. Well, for those who've been watching Donald Trump for the last three and a half years, we know it's not tongue in cheek. And I'll tell you why. Because on May the 15th, he said the following. Testing was overrated. When you test, you have a case. And when you test, you find something's wrong with people. If we didn't do any testing, we would have very few cases. And then on 15th of June on Twitter, he says, if we stop testing, we would have fewer cases. So if it's a joke, it's an ongoing running joke, but we all know that Donald Trump doesn't have a sense of humor to begin with. So to throw his staff under the bus on uh, the 23rd in an interview with Scripps TV with one of the station reporters, he said, if you did slow down, frankly, I think we're way ahead of ourselves, to tell you the truth. So Donald Trump in his, his own little world, his own little mind, has convinced himself that testing is irrelevant, COVID-19 is in his rearview mirror, and it's onto the election, and 120,000 Americans' deaths be damned. Who cares? I need to get reelected. And with that, I'm going to jump in and say hello to our guests. Uh, special today, we have Jay Fidel. He's made a return trip. We have Stephanie Dalton and Cynthia Sinclair. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us, Tim. Oh, it's a pleasure. And I'm glad to see you all back. And uh, Jay, I'm just going to jump right into you regarding the, uh, the comment from Donald Trump at the Tulsa rally. Um, your, your thoughts? Your, 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 what was your initial reaction when you, when you heard this yet again from Donald Trump? Now, this is his way of dealing with the problem lie um, and you know the number of lies go on and on he, he lied to begin with to say that we don't need testing and he lied about what he said <laughs> and he lied about the joke uh, so what we have is an ongoing pattern pattern is hardly the word for it uh, it's a full full tilt boogie on lies from the beginning till now and uh, just just to add one thought to that is that we cannot have a president in office who lies to us this is what happens, 120,000 lives. What do they think about him? Well, and what about those who are in an age category where their immune system is compromised or they're, you know, they're older? older. And um, do you think that they're thinking that Donald Trump has their best interest in mind as he moves forward? Nobody who's rational thinks Donald Trump has their best interest in mind, but I'm, I'm sorry to say there are a lot of people in this country who nevertheless irrationally think they believe him, uh, which is a problem that we have to deal with. Uh, I think we should examine that, all of us, uh, to see why this country, anybody in this country believes him when he's a congenital uh, liar. Now, we, we can all have our opinions about whether or not, um, you know, Don's, Donald's um, fringe support, which is beyond the 42% or whatever number you want to assign to that, um, whether or not they're shifting in their opinions, but the polls seem to be suggesting just that, that um, white males are starting to shift away from Donald Trump and as well as uh, college educated white women. Uh, the suburban uh, crowd is shifting away from Donald Trump in the uh, polls that are coming out. Um, do you think that can continues to widen? No, I did. I do think it continues to widen. I think it largely has to do with recent events. Um, possibly the Tulsa rally is an important event for that. And every single poll that's been reported shows that he's lost ground. He's in, you know, 
35% as against Biden's uh, way over 50% all across the board. And that, and that gives you two, two thoughts. One is he must be desperate and he's sad. And uh, there were photographs of him getting off the helicopter after Tulsa. He looked pretty bedraggled and unhappy, uh, a broken man, if you will, because of his under, under attendance at that uh, rally. So yes, I think it's clear that he's desperate. And the other point that comes out of it is, um, you know, desperate people do desperate things. You're going to see him in the next 120 days do the most remarkable things to, as you said, Tim, to play to the base, uh, to play to the people who would still support and believe him and so forth. You're going to see him do the most remarkable things on or about election day too. God knows what kind of emergencies we're going to have. God knows what kind of absolutely crazy things he's going to do at that time. So it's, it goes both ways. Uh, one is he doesn't look so good and people see that. The other is he's going to do some crazy stuff. All right. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Stephanie, what was your opinion about the uh, Tulsa rally, specifically him trying to uh, slow down testing, but also other things that we saw there? And that was, quite frankly, the, uh, the sparse crowds, the crowds that he had thought were going to be in excess of, um, you know, 40,000 people. He even prepared an outside seating stage and seating arrangement for uh, overflow guests. Yet we all saw that he packed them in like sardines wherever he could just to try to get some density images. Uh, but if you pan the cameras up a little bit, the whole upper tier was, was vacant, empty. Yeah, uh -huh. but the source of my spot of good feeling for the week, which I <laughs> nurtured my little flame. Anyway, um, yes, and uh, because it missed expectations um, and by two thirds, uh, at least two thirds, because they said that the arena was only about third full, plus he had the outdoor overflow. So uh, it missed by a long shot. And that sounds like a little bit of gaming out there in the country. It sounded like it was something maybe from youngsters, uh, uh, teens, uh, people on the uh, internet playing the game of let's sign up for the rally, even though we're not gonna go. So a little taste of his own medicine perhaps there was another a little bit of a bump to the good feeling that it's about time tables turn some. So um, I also found that I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I, I saw whatever clips I saw on the, on the other programs, but it didn't look like he had practiced anything or put together anything new. Uh, there really wasn't uh, a, a coach. Well, I, I think he did put something in there new and he talked about for about 15 minutes, the fact that he had to explain his his his, um, his shuffle, you know, down the ramp at West Point. Um, he went into great length to try to convince the audience that there's nothing wrong with me. And it was just the fact that it was a metal ramp and there was no railings and uh, it was wet. And um, boy, wouldn't the uh, liberal media love to watch me fall down and, and make hay of that. So he spent 15 minutes just discussing that. Yeah, he, he's uh, getting old. So yeah, and that, that was... Uh, kind of little turnaround fair play too, given what they, whoever did to Hillary during the last round. I'm not speaking as Hillary's, uh, you know, as my my uh, camp, my favorite, but I'm just mentioning that a lot of that went on with her. Yeah, so I, I've seen some Republican ads that are touting that the Democrats want to do all of these things while they stay off in their mansions and they themselves keep themselves safe and they of course keep their incomes but yet they spend everybody else's money on all of these communistic and socialistic policies and I mean I just had to laugh because of the mirroring that that they're doing about everything that said they say back and for instance here is Donald Trump standing up on the stage when he did invite participants to the stage it was extraordinarily distance i mean like off kilter for the tv camera maybe 40 feet right I mean, yeah. protecting himself from you know any possibility and of course he never mentions and i don't know why fauci and these other people don't mention that he has protection just around the clock and also people checking on him continuously. Well, that's a good point. He is so, I mean, it's, we can't, we get to the pinnacle of hypocrisy when anyone who gets near him is required to be tested, yet he's fine and dandy to stuff people into a, you know, into an arena 
and not worry about masks and or you know um, social distancing. I, I, I find it really amazing that because you had so many empty seats that someone right then and there didn't say, hey, you know what? We can actually space some people out here and protect them. <laughs> that too, I did, why didn't that? But they are not in that headset. So they're not following directions and they're not buying into any of the scientific evidence. So this is another version of seeing their belief systems and their devotion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This, okay, and he's yep. not serving them well as that kind of a faux leader. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. Hey, Cynthia, um, were there any jaw dropping moments for you uh, by watching some of the excerpts from the, the Tulsa rally? Um, your mute's on. I actually watched the whole thing, and um, <laughs> the whole thing made my jaw drop. Oh, okay. Not so no one, no one particular moment. The entire, the well, entire rally. Okay. The entire rally, but before they even started, they all had to sign a release saying that they wouldn't sue him if they got sick, which was the jaw dropping moment to start with for me. And then his, like you said, 15 minutes on how well he can walk and how well he can hold a glass and to see the crowd go crazy when all he did was drink some water and then he thinks they, they started to applaud. So of course he decides he wants to do it again, drinks a little more water and then shows how tough he is by throwing it down on the stage. And I just thought- <laughs> That was a special moment. I, I... I agree with that. <laughs> How arrogant do you have to be to, to, to do something like that? And how stupid do you have to be to cheer for it? I don't know, I, I was just blown away by all of that. And okay. we it was a lot to take in. And I will tell you that the Lincoln Project did make great, great use of his um, slowing down testing in the form of a, um, a political ad that was, in my opinion, quite, it was a home run. And uh, we'll see how that plays, not only in, 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 in Oklahoma, but we'll see how it plays in Arizona and all these other states that he insists on cramming people together and exposing them to COVID-19, all for his political pleasure. Right, and two days later, or not even two days, or two days later, we've got all of the scientists, we've got uh, Fauci, we've got Redfield, we've got all the guys sitting in front of Congress, in front of the, what you call it, uh, giving their testimony yesterday morning telling us that yes, we need to wear masks. Yes, we need to socially distance. The numbers are going up and up and up. Texas and, um, and Arizona, both just today have the highest number of cases they've ever had before. They're breaking records. And well, yet- I, I guarantee you in two weeks, you'll see those numbers accelerate from where they are oh, even yes. today. Yes, we will. I agree with but you. But I'm sure on Corona, um, Coronaville, Jay, you'll have that down and you, you'll be all over that topic. Yes, we will. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's one last one last thing. Let's touch on uh, at the Tulsa rally. He used the term for the second time now, Kung Flu. And uh, that seems to have made a mark for his loyal base, but it's not selling well to the rest of the public. And I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Jay, let's go to you on this. What was, um, what was, what's his strategy about bringing up Kung oh, was, Flu and? No, it's racist. It's racist. racist. It's, it's no other way to put it. It's been characterized as racist when he started doing it in the first place. Everybody knows the signal he's sending. And the signal is, I don't like the Chinese and you, you shouldn't like the Chinese either. They're bad people. Um, so he's trying to divide in the country and he's trying to um, you know, attack the Chinese so that people who don't like the Chinese will, will join him, you know, part of his base. They're anti-immigration, they're, you know, just hateful. Uh, what's interesting is the remarkable thing that happened at the, at the same time. Bolton wrote a book and published the book this week. I think it came out yesterday, but it was, parts of it were out for a while, in which he said that Trump made a deal uh, with Xi Jinping um, to give him a break on agricultural product pricing and other things in return for Xi Jinping's supporting Trump in the election. God knows what nefarious things that means. It could be, uh, you know, the same kind of social media gambit 
uh, that Putin did last time around. Maybe we'll have it from both sides this time. But, but you know, Trump was, he said he was joking at the time. He said, oh, I was only joking when he, when he said that he was going to try to get uh, Xi Jinping to do that. Now it's clear it's documented. He well, is trying he, to get Xi Jinping to do that. At the well, same he's, time, he's, he's making- he's been, on, he's been quoted on TV saying, um, George Stephanopoulos saying, hey, if they called me up, I'd listen to what they had to say about my, my opponent. Why right. not? But now we have now we have hard copy. It wasn't him waiting for a call. It was him making a call. And by the way, it was only three days ago uh, that Pompeo was here in Hawaii, uh, furthering those discussions about the pricing on agricultural products. That and that has to be part of the discussions. This unholy deal. You never heard more more about that. We never even really heard much press that Pompeo was here. And we certainly didn't hear what they talked about. And we didn't hear exactly what you know the nature of this deal was. Only person it comes from right now is Bolton. I believe Bolton. Well, I, you know, I think you said it yourself, the next 120 days, we're gonna see all sorts of outrageous things. Jerry Nadler was interviewed saying, you know, this discussion about firing the Manhattan district, um, uh, U.S. Attorney uh, Jeffrey Berman, and he goes, yeah, a bar should be impeached, but we got 120 days. I doubt that's going to happen politically. So uh, to, to what degree do we see travesty after travesty in the next 120 days, and what can you do about it? And Bolton's book, whether I think it's probably factually accurate, um, and you know, getting China involved with Donald Trump and the uh, re-election here, um, to what degree do we stop it, and can we do anything about it? No, and as you said, and, and we both said, it's it's going to get worse. I mean, the 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 Trump thing with um, uh, Michael Flynn, um, who pleaded guilty on a, a couple of occasions. Uh, the Department of Justice, you know, tried to uh, withdraw that prosecution. Uh, Judge Sullivan in in uh, in District Columbia uh, found that he wasn't so quick. He's not going to be so quick to allow the withdrawal of the, of the charges, because it's obvious that everything that Barr does is a pass through from Trump. They are one and the same. Okay, and Judge Sullivan put it out for some amicus briefs, and Judge Sullivan, you know, hired a master uh, in order to help him make the ruling. And then the government, that is Barr, appealed, the government appealed um, that ruling by Sullivan uh, to the DC circuit. And this morning, if you haven't noticed, the DC circuit through a judge who was appointed by Trump, okay, ruled that, that the, the case had to be withdrawn and that Barr rules. So uh, to, to go to your point, Tim, that's what's gonna happen from here to election day. The most outrageous things. One commentator said, this is the end of the rule of law. I agree. Well, uh, that was um, also in, in testimony of the DOJ, former DOJ um, senior, senior official, I believe his name was Donald Ayer. He said exactly that. This is the end of the rule of law. And then we had um, Aaron Zelinsky, um, a former prosecutor of the D Department of Justice, basically said, hey, I know we, we were told that Roger Stone had preferential treatment from, from Barr and, and Donald Trump. So we kind of hands off. We put hands off on it. Um, so these, these are coming to light. They're being known. It, what can one do about it? And I think your answer is good. Not a whole lot. So um, Cynthia, let me ask you something. Right now, Barr is showing his hand explicitly that he is the lap dog and the lackey for Donald Trump. Whatever Donald Trump wants, Barr is more than happy and willing to do it. Um, Here's what Barr said this week. Right now, a foreign country could print up tens of thousands of counterfeit ballots, and it would be harder for us to detect them, which was right and which ones were wrong. That was in for a Fox News interview. So William Barr seems to be playing hand in hand with the idea that Donald Trump thinks that all mail-in ballots are fraudulent. And if you watched a little bit of his Arizona rally yesterday, it got a lot scarier. He basically said, the Democrats are rigging this election, they're rigging it now, and we can't allow that to happen. So like 2016, Donald Trump is throwing that up in the air saying, if I don't win, this whole thing was taken away from me and from you, most importantly, voters, that um, my election has been 
been stolen. Right. And that's, you're right. That's exactly what he's doing. He's setting the stage for that exact thing. We also have to remember the element of projection because everything that he does and says basically is a projection, which means he's doing it. So when he says the Democrats are going to cheat, that means he's going to cheat. When he says the Democrats are doing such and such, it means that he is doing that thing. So I think it's always important to remember. And But he does all this gaslighting stuff, and that's what it's all about. So that by the time we do get, and we talk a lot about that here on the show. We talked right? about last week. Yeah, and, and so by the time we do get to the election, if he does lose, he's going to say, oh, it was rigged. Everybody cheated. And he's already laid the groundwork for that. And that's what gaslighting is. So that's the, it's the perfect example of, of outright gaslighting. Well, when you have your, your, your top cop of the country, the attorney general, um, basically on the same song sheet as that all mail-in ballot should be perceived as fraudulent or, or ripe with uh, fraud. Um, and we have several states that do it. Uh, what's the end result here? If he doesn't win the election, are we going to have the Boogaloo, uh, the Boogaloo um, factions, the high military, you know, extreme right, uh, take to the streets, or are we going to peacefully get through all this? No, I don't think we will peacefully get through it. And and I think a really good sort of microcosm example of it is um, just this weekend there was a rally, or not a rally, I'm sorry, a, a protest set up for Black Lives Matter to come forward in a small town in Ohio. And so what happened was a bunch of bikers showed up at the same time, armed in you know fatigues, and the police are doing nothing. These people that were there to represent counter protesting um, were armed with rifles. They were shouting threats, we're gonna kill you, we're gonna bury you, we'll put you where they can't find you. All of these things that are on tape, you can hear them saying, and the police are doing nothing about it. And instead of getting in between the, the protesters and the counter protesters, the, it seemed like the police were almost pushing the, pro, the counter protesters forward to be closer to the protesters. So you're and, thinking they're trying to agitate. And I'm sorry, what now? You're thinking the police were actually trying to agitate the crowd versus to keep it separate. Absolutely, you can totally tell. And I think the thing that struck me the most was that they're calling all the people, the protesters, not the counter protesters, but the protesters are being called traitors. Traitors, go back where you came from. You're all traitors. And I thought, now where did we hear that from? Where did we get this from? Oh, yeah, that's what Trump has been saying. Obama was a traitor. The Democrats are traitors. And so now his base has picked up that moniker and off they run with it. And they're Alrighty. attaching it to everyone. All righty. Stephanie, what are your thoughts about William Barr and the fact that he's, he's joined, uh, fully joined Donald Trump with the fraud of mail-in ballots and then, of course, all uh, the influence with either uh, Roger Stone or Michael Flynn cases. Well, George Washington University Law School has written him a letter or made a statement about his malfeasance and his the need for him to resign. So there's professional pressure coming. That was on. his alma mater, was it not? It was his alma mater, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. We all know people from there, but um, the. Uh, um, not that we all know, but, um, you know, that's a, a big school and uh, right there in D.C. But um, I think that uh, he is, we've got to put on our seatbelts, okay, strap on the seatbelts because he is going to probably maybe be taken to the Supreme Court this case. That is one of Sullivan's options is he can choose to move it on up to the Supreme Court or there's another option to do something within the in the, the district circuit court or whatever it is. Jay, maybe you can talk about that later. But I think that we need to remember with our strapped on seatbelts, we got to keep our eyes on the prize because this is just going to continue because there's no holds barred on him. And the bigger bigger picture is if we get a Mr. Uh, Biden in, 
then the questions are going to be, you know, what are we going to do to protect ourselves from this in the future? Is that yeah. what how much of a piece of the agenda is that going to be? And of course, he can't talk about that ahead of time, but he's got a lot of cleanup to do. And then we've got to decide this is going to be a very interesting uh, issue to, to for the president to take on. And I'm sure with Obama's, you know, influence and support and his um, his constitutional background, maybe we can figure out how to get protected. Does, does the um, House Oversight Committee, do they get any bang for their buck by having him testify in July, William Barr? Uh, yes, I, I'm very pleased. I don't know that he'll go. He's king of the hill. He may or may not go. We knew uh, nothing about uh, anything until it leaks out one way or another. And here again is the media issue. Are they doing enough of their job? I mean, I've criticized them for keeping Trump in front of our face all through the 16 election and way too much overdue on him. And now here we're in the mess of it's always about the latest piece that's upsetting. What about the research and the background stuff? Okay, like you were saying earlier in the chess game, what's going on on the back bench? Tim and uh, who what's coming next and let's hear more. I mean, we're, uh, we're going to be overblown by all of these judges who are in, in inexperienced, at least, if not incompetent and considered so by the ABA and other other certifying organizations. What what about all this? What what yeah. is what is the rest? Well, as Jay said, expect more in the next 120 days. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, and I don't know if any of us do. I, I'm not sure half of half of Congress has an answer on how to apply the brakes to this runaway train of a president. Um, but we're almost out of time. Let's switch gears. Uh, Jay, to you, Donald Trump just extended the ban on uh, visas, entry visas for foreign workers. You think that's going to have an impact on farm uh, farm produce and and um, employment? And what what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, you know. It, it, he does, he makes these moves without having a plan, aside from the, you know, the bad temper of them uh, and the corruption of them. I mean, he just got finished negotiating the sale of additional agricultural product, products to China. So now he's, uh, he's cutting off a labor supply uh, that is necessary to grow those agricultural products. Go figure. Uh, we're, we're in a reopening, aren't we? We need labor. We need to engage labor in the field. We need to get back to productivity. So you, you terminate a source of an important source of labor. Uh, I can't figure that out. Now, uh, don't you think a lot of Republicans are all in favor of, um, you know, um, illegal immigration in order to pull the crops out of the fields? Well, it's just as you said before, Tim, this is his way of playing to the anti-immigration crowd in the country. He thinks they're going to you know, solidify behind him and vote for him. Uh, this way, they'll forget about his lying and his machinations uh, because they, they like anti-immigration. It's really back more of the same. It's the wall. All it's the wall, again. and that's, he played that card yesterday in Arizona. Um, he talked a lot about the wall again. So, in fact, he visited the wall, and he wrote his name on the wall. So I don't know what more he could do. He's certainly oh, not I, building I, the I wall. I think he can do a lot more, and I think he will do a lot more. I, I think he's crazy like a fox. He wants to be reelected. He put it another way, he wants to stay in power. And we're going to see the most incredible machinations from him. He has no boundaries, no limits, moral, legal, or otherwise. And he is destroying, in many, in many regards, he's already destroyed the balance of power in the government. In many ways, he's divided the country beyond redemption. We're in, we're in a terrible crisis right now. Um, so Agreed, I, and, and, I and it doesn't seem like any anyone optimism. can do anything to stop it. Yeah. Only the yeah. election, but, but he is trying to undermine the election. Imagine getting up and saying, uh, I, I want to stop the post office because people who vote by mail will vote against me. Um, uh, unbelievable statement. He wants to suppress voting. He has the Republican parties in so many states working to do that. He is trying really hard. And then he says, I do not necessarily agree with the election. If I win, I agree with it. If I lose, it was all rigged. He said the same rigged. thing that's in right. 2016. And that's, and that's dangerous. That's, that's promoting insurrection. And quite frankly, um, he may succeed partially in this. OK, we have run out of time. Real quick, uh, Cynthia, predictions for next week. Real quick. Well, I think we're going to hear more about Barr because obviously they're in the process of looking at him. And um, 
hopefully, Stephanie, you'll have another bit of good news to hold on to coming up this week. Okay. We Great. Will, all of us will have a little bit of good news. The one thing that I say is good news from all of this, nobody died in Tulsa, and it could have easily been that. It was, nobody died yet. Yeah. Yeah, because of the, yeah, thank you for. Okay. Hey, we're out of time. Uh, Jay Fidel, thank you for joining us. Stephanie thank you, Dalton, Jay. thank you. Cynthia Sinclair, as always, thank you for joining us. I'm Tim Apicella. This is Trump Week. We'll see you next Wednesday, 11 o'clock. Aloha. Aloha.